Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screens for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. And welcome to another exciting episode of Doctor in the House. I'm your host, Dr. Muhammad Rahman, and it's a pleasure to be with you. So, we'll go straight into our first segment this evening, Medical News, where we discuss some current medical news and trends relevant to us here in Sweet TNT. So today, we're going to be discussing the 2019 novel coronavirus, also known as SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. As you might have heard by now, in December of 2019, reports of a new type of viral illness emerged amongst persons in Wuhan province, China. Following this, the virus was identified and named the 2019 novel coronavirus. Other members of this family of coronaviruses include those which cause the common cold, as well as the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or SARS, of 2002-2003, as well as the Middle East Met Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS, of 2012. More recently, the infection caused by the 2019 novel coronavirus was named by the scientific community as SARS-CoV-2, and then simultaneously named COVID-19. COVID-19 is derived from the CO, or the CO is derived from corona, the VI from virus, and the D for disease, which is annoying to some, as coronavirus is actually one word. In spite of this, we will go on ahead and call this COVID-19 for our own purposes here. The early symptoms of COVID-19, that's novel coronavirus-19 infection, includes fever, coughs, muscle pains, fatigue, sputum production, and headache. And these are also the most common symptoms of many viral illnesses. Symptoms in COVID-19 may appear anywhere between two and 14 days after exposure. More serious common complications of COVID-19 occur after the first week of illness and are related to the lungs or the respiratory tract with a majority of patients showing evidence of pneumonia on chest x-rays or CT scans. As for how many people COVID has killed, well, the death toll is rising, as would be expected with a virus of this type, but not nearly as much as some other viruses have in recent history. The mortality rate, or the proportion of patients of whom, or who have acquired the infection who die in COVID patients, is about 3 to 4 percent. By comparison, the SARS outbreak of 2002 and 2003 uh, there was a 9.6% mortality, meaning just about one in every 10 persons who developed the infection 
died. During the MERS outbreak of 2012, there was a 34% reported mortality, which means that roughly one in every three people who acquired the infection were likely to die. Those persons most at risk of severe illness in COVID-19 and most viral illnesses include those at the extremes of age, the very young, as well as the very old, as well as those with pre-existing medical problems, specifically heart disease, chronic lung diseases like asthma, and COPD, and that's like chronic bronchitis or emphysema, diabetes, liver cirrhosis, chronic kidney diseases, or even persons who are pregnant, or those who are on medicines that suppress the immune system or who have reasons to have an immunocompromised state or a suppressed immune system. The overwhelming majority of people with COVID-19 are likely to have a mild to moderate illness with full recovery. Furthermore, many more persons will get other common viral illnesses other than COVID-19. Now, the treatment of COVID-19 is mostly supportive which means that we just provide the things that the body needs until it can recover from the infection. Some persons may require intensive care interventions, and this may be required in up to a third of patients. Unlike influenza A, for example, there is no specific treatment yet known for COVID-19. With influenza, that is viruses like the H1N1 virus, we do have medications which specifically treat that type of infection. So the emphasis in COVID-19 is on prevention. Unfortunately, no vaccine exists currently or is currently available for COVID-19, but the annual flu vaccine can prevent you from getting other viruses that can cause harm. So as we're talking about prevention of the COVID-19, one of the most important things that uh, we can do is actually, or some of the most important things we can do are actually the very simple things. And particularly here, first up on the list, we want to talk about hand washing. Uh, hand washing, we want to wash the hands for about 20 seconds at a minimum with soap and water or an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. These are usually used until it dries up. You should wash your hands particularly after coughing or sneezing. If you're caring for somebody else who's ill or you're attending to somebody else who's ill, before, during and after food preparation, before eating, and of course, after using the toilet, whenever your hands are dirty, you should wash your hands and make sure that your hands are washed appropriately. Not just for the uh, prevention of spread of germs, but also in this case, particularly for the, the spread of viral infections. These viral infections can remain on surfaces inactive for more than a week, which means that if a week ago somebody had a viral illness, and in this case we're talking about COVID-19, and it were on the table or on an escalator at the mall, and I were passing by and I just rubbed my hand on it, there's a chance that I could actually have picked up particles of a virus. So another thing that we need to do, aside from frequent hand washing, is also to avoid touching our eyes or nose or the mouth with unwashed hands. And the reason is because we can inoculate ourselves with these viruses or cause ourselves to become infected with them. We should also avoid close contact with anyone who has a cold or anyone who has flu-like symptoms. And the rationale here is that they may actually have a virus that you don't want to get. So you try to avoid them or avoid close contact particularly. It's recommended that meat and eggs are thoroughly cooked and Persons are to avoid unprotected contact with wild or farm animals. As for why this is, we're going to come back a little bit later and chat with one of our guests uh, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the coronavirus infection. We should avoid spreading any virus that we may have by covering our nose and mouth when we cough or sneeze. Ideally, this should be into tissue or otherwise into your flexed elbow. So some people say that that's disgusting. You're sneezing into your clothes, you're going to get mucus on there. But the idea is that you don't shake somebody's hand with your elbow, usually. You shake their hand with your hand. So if you cough or sneeze into your bare hand, and then you go to greet somebody, then there's a chance you are going to be spreading a virus, if you have it, to that person. So into the flexed elbow is a bit better because it's not likely to go on to spread to somebody else in that situation. Of course, if you're sneezing into a tissue, it can be easily thrown away. And if you do have an illness and you have to come into contact with other people, frequent hand washing is also going to be very important. So to further discuss this topic, I'm very pleased to have on our show tonight, 
Uh, specially invited guest, Dr. Avery Hines, an epidemiologist and public health consultant. Uh, we are originally supposed to have an additional guest, uh, Dr. Dale Vento, a critical care specialist and uh, lecturer at the University of the West Indies. Uh, however, unfortunately, he's been called away on an emergency tonight, and we are hoping that he's still able to make it a little bit later on in the show. So for now, we're going to take a break and pay some bills, and we're going to be back to chat with our guest, Dr. Avery Hines, about COVID-19. Don't go away. See you here shortly. blood pressure is as dangerous as an overpumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. Microlife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. Microlife AFib screens for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. Microlife, a partner for people, for life. Attention all bakers, doubles vendors, and roti makers. Try our high-quality unbleached bromate-free all-purpose and baker's flour. Low price and conveniently packaged in 2 pounds, 2 kg, 10 kg, and 25 kg bags. For wholesale and retail prices, contact Shikleisha Limited, 665-3336, or visit us at Warrenville, Canupia. Shikleisha Limited, quality you can trust. And welcome back to Doctor in the House. And it is my pleasure to introduce our, our specially invited guest, Dr. Avery Hines. Avery, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here on Doctor in the House. Pleasure to be so here. Have you ever been on Doctor in the House before? I do not believe so. Fantastic. I'm this not is your maiden voyage. I think it is my maiden voyage, yes. Excellent. So, Avery, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, so I, I, I introduced you as a public health consultant and an epidemiologist. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm almost certain that a lot of my audience can't or wouldn't appreciate what epidemiology is and what, a public, what public health is. Um, so, Let's, let's start off a little bit about that. What is, what is an epidemiologist? Okay, I'd like to start with what epidemiology is not. Epidemiology is not about skin. <laughs> no people, yeah. it's the first thing people ask, that's skin, right? And I think they're confusing the word epidermis with epidemic. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, epidemiology yeah. is not about skin, it's not about breakouts, it's about outbreaks. There we go. And it's looking at the things that make people ill and which people are at risk of getting ill and how to prevent people from getting ill patterns of disease spread, epidemics, that sort of thing. So the formal definition is the study of the determinants and distribution of disease. Determinants, things that get you ill, distribution, who's getting ill. Who's actually getting ill. Right? And public health then incorporates that into a wider range of disciplines, looking at how to intervene to prevent people from getting ill, all the way from the education to the intervention. And it's a very broad and very important discipline but it's also a very under-recognized discipline for the simple reason that when everything in public health is going well, nothing happens. Everybody's well, there's no complaint, there's no outbreak, and therefore you don't recognize that there's a lot of work happening to keep it that way. A lot of work going on behind the scenes. A lot the of scenes work behind the scenes to make sure that nothing happens. Beautiful. So Avery, before we go into your path to becoming, becoming an epidemiologist, Tell us a little bit about your time in Trinidad growing up. Of course, you are Trinidadian, and what, how, how did you get to where you are now? Okay, well, I, I was uh, commenting to a friend the other day that I'm older than I realize, and that by the time I had graduated from medical school, it was just the turn of this century. 
which is now 20 years ago. <laughs> so uh, when I was growing up, this was the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, and I enjoyed the very simple life. I enjoyed all the things that we enjoyed about Trinidad, or one TV station, right? Uh, yeah. a lot of play outside, which is very important in terms of the preventing the obesity epidemic and the things that we're now dealing with because of all the indoor entertainment. Yes. I went to St. Mary's College as my secondary school, Fantastic. did both sciences and languages there. In fact, oh. I did, so I did sciences, languages, and math and ad math in form five. Both languages, all the sciences. Wow. And I did all the sciences in form six, which is generally not recommended. <laughs> but I liked all three sciences, so I did phys, chem, and bio. Wow. Yeah, most people don't do that. Clutton for pain. Apparently. <laughs> and then I went on to do medicine. And from the at the University of the, the University West of the West Indies here in Trinidad and Tobago, the St. Augustine campus, and then I went to the University of Cambridge to do epidemiology. And this is Cambridge, UK, not Cambridge, Massachusetts. Right, there we go. And how was that experience? It was wonderful. It was actually very interesting. You realized how much of your uh, upbringing had lots of the British colonial overtones, things that you didn't realize you'd recognize, but you do. <laughs> words that you've, so you've seen in Enid Blyton books and then you hear them used on the street and you're like, people really say that? <laughs> Things like that. So that was interesting. Cambridge is a beautiful city. It really is. Mm -hmm. And it's not too far from London, so you, know, you could always go do all the activity in London and then come back to the calm and beauty of Cambridge because Cambridge has wonderful architecture. The college is amazing. It was built over 800 years ago, so architecture back then was a source of pride. Right. Yeah, so... They should be paying you for this, actually. I really they want to go to I, Cambridge. You know, I, I actually should, I should tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> and after Cambridge, how was your time? Uh, after Cambridge, I came back to Trinidad and Tobago and started working at various levels within our health system. So I worked at the regional health authority level, and we started looking at pulling public health and epidemiology together in a more concerted way at regional level. It was still a developing area at that point in time. Then I moved on to the national level, uh, working at the Ministry of Health for a bit, and then to the, the Caribbean regional level. So not regional health authority, but Caribbean region, working at the Caribbean Public Health Agency, CARFA. CARFA. Right. So that's sort of the, the path we taken so far. Excellent. So, uh, Avery, you are representing uh, the Trinidad and Tobago Medical Association here tonight. And this is not your first interview about the, the novel coronavirus, is it? Correct. This is either my third or fourth, I'm not sure. But, but I'm enjoying being able to share useful or hopefully useful information uh, with as many and as wide an audience as possible. What do you think about the corona? And this might be a very obvious question. What do you think about the coronavirus that is it that makes it so uh, interesting or something that everybody wants to find out about? It's all over the news. It's every hour on the hour on BBC. You can see it on CNN all the time. You can barely turn on international news network and not hear something about it. So, what about this virus makes this so special? Well, the fact that it's new, the novelty makes it a source of both interest and concern. The fact that we're not quite sure what's going to happen and we are watching very closely and carefully as each health outcome evolves because we are really not sure where the virus will go with regard to its sort of final uh, distribution, uh, final mortality rate, etc. We're looking to see what is the pattern of illness, who's getting ill, how quickly it's spreading. And because the situation is changing so rapidly, day by day, you get more information. That's keeping people on their toes. It's keeping both the public health specialists and the lay public very uh, keenly attuned to the developments. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's as it should be. It's, there was a similar sort of interest 10 or 11 years ago when pandemic influenza came out and we were in the same situation. Not sure exactly what's going to happen and lots of interest in each and every outcome. And then 10 years down the road, here we are doing basically the same thing again with the next new thing. How different would the international response to the coronavirus had been if this were, let's say, 20 years ago? Now, 20 years ago would be just around the time when we were in medical school or leaving medical school. I think that the response is, uh, it has been 
curated by past experience. So 20 years ago, we did not have the new version of the international health regulations. In fact, in 2003, the other coronavirus that made coronaviruses famous, that was the SARS coronavirus, came out and it showed sort of the inadequacy of what we were asking people to report on. We had a specific list of diseases, three or four things. If you see these, you report these internationally. And that virus didn't fit the bill. It wasn't one of the things that needed international reporting. It wasn't mandated. And it then had the opportunity to get past some of the uh, checks and balances that would otherwise have been in place. And in the wake of that experience, public health as a whole realized that we need to update the response to new public health threats. And the IHR 2005 was born. So it was born out of a past experience with the coronavirus. And so 20 years ago, it would have been quite different. Uh, since that, we've learned that not just things you know, but things that you don't know and realize that you don't know can be a threat. And therefore, if something is unknown or unusual, we flag it. If it's unusual and has the possibility of spreading to lots of people, we flag it. If it can spread to lots of people and cause uh, havoc within the health system because of the number of people that get you know, seriously ill, we flag it. If it can spread in internationally, we flag it. Right. And then if it can uh, look to threaten international trade and travel, that's another flag. So there, there's some criteria that things need to meet in order to be flagged as public health events of international concern. And this new coronavirus now called, uh, not the disease is called COVID-19, coronavirus disease, that event met the criteria for being flagged as a public health event of international concern. And the head of the WHO uh, so deemed it, I think, at the end of January. Right. So, so the first doctor in China, I mean, th this is, this is a, a story that I think we're probably going to continue to hear about for the next 10 years or more. Uh, or more. Um, the, the doctor who had really raised the first alarm in China uh, uh, was actually quieted, it's reportedly was quieted down by the authorities at that time. Um, and it, it's something that he really fought for to make sure that this information got out and that they, they, they will got it because I suppose he recognized the pattern that was emerging uh, and, and something that knew that was there. And sadly, well, let's talk about that for a second before we talk about what, 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 what happened to him afterwards. What are the pros and cons to the, the mentality that we should downplay uh, an illness when it comes on? I know there are more, many more cons than pros. I'm just being devil's advocate here. Uh, when, when, when there's a, a, a new virus on the scene, there's a tendency that uh, administrations and some governments in some countries have to kind of imagine it's not there. Uh, could you chat a little bit about that? Okay, now I, I've heard that sort of lens put on the communication coming out of China with regard to the new virus. I'm not sure it's entirely either A, accurate, or B, fear. Mm -hmm. Now, what has happened is because of the first experience with SARS coronavirus, where there was less uh, transparent information sharing. The stigma has remained that when things turn up in, in, in the East, uh, they're played down. In this case, we really have to, I think, commend the officials with the speed with which they shared the relevant information with the WHO. Now, sharing the relevant information through official channels is one thing that has, you know, a, a, a timeline that has to go through the various levels of you know, bureaucracy, bureaucracy, so to speak. Right. And sometimes there is the feeling that there's a need to share the information with the public in a faster way. And that has pros and cons. One of the pros is clearly people would be aware of what's happening. But the con is that if you don't have enough information to characterize the situation properly and give people a clear idea of what's happening, you raise more questions and answers and create fear and panic. So the, the balance there in communication, and that's why communication is a, a skill in and of itself. It's an art form and it's a skill set, and they, they are trained communicators to ensure that you strike the balance between early and prompt sharing of useful information and the, the avoidance of panic by sharing partial information that doesn't allow people to get a clear idea of what's happening. What are some of the consequences of 
national fear and widespread fear and panic. And, and just again, being devil's advocate here, um, what sorts of things, and we could probably discuss this, would we see on a, on a national level? What, what impact would that have? I mean, right off the top of my head, I'm imagining people just running to the accident in emergency departments or the health centers for anything remotely sounding like a virus. And everything remotely sounding like a virus. So when we have a lack of understanding of what really requires uh, immediate hospital attention, you do get the emergency rooms and the health facilities being overwhelmed by people who would not normally have come in. And because they're overwhelmed, they're overcrowded, there are people who do have respiratory illness and those who don't. Those who don't are now being exposed in greater proportion to people with respiratory illness that they may not have come in for in the first place. So there's that uh, tendency to sort of amplify spread by crowding lots of coughing, sneezing people together. Right, so to, 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 to break that down a little bit again, that, that, that's a huge thing. So if everybody were to run into an accident in the emergency department for very minor complaints that might not be related to COVID-19 uh, COVID at all, they may actually pick up a virus there, whether it's COVID-19 or H1N1 or another virus. That's H3N2, human metanumovirus, respiratory syncytial virus. There are lots of things in circulation besides the flu, which is the most common thing we have, and the COVID-19, which we do not currently have. <laughs> so we do need to be aware that lots of things are going to cause respiratory symptoms. All of them don't necessitate you rushing to the emergency room. When you overwhelm the health system, then people who actually need care who are more severely ill don't necessarily get it in time. And then that worsens their outcomes because if you don't get care in time, you become more ill, you can have more adverse outcomes. You, you, know, you, need, you need either to be hospitalized or to go into ICU, worst case scenario, you don't actually make it. So it's sort of, there's a domino effect from the wild rush of the worried well to the, the health facilities. Beyond that, the behavior spreads out of the health facilities to other places. What we saw a lot of in the pandemic flu time was the general refusal of parents to keep their sniffly children at home. Oh my God, yes. But what they would do is send the sniffly, sniffling, coughing kids to school because, well, you know, it's just a, it's just a cold. And then if they hear anybody else had some uh, flu-like illness, they keep their well kids at home. <laughs> So to keep the well kids at home and send the sniffly ones to school, it's not the best. It's not a recipe for success. It's a, it's a recipe for disruption. That's a cultural issue, it I, is. I think, in Trinidad, isn't it? And I, I don't know how uh, the medical association could possibly try to change that culture of people to recognize that if somebody's ill, they shouldn't be in a place where they can spread it to everybody else. You know, um, my own son just got sick at school again, and he has to be at home right now. And it's, it, the thing about it is there are always children who are sniffling and mm -hmm. about the place. And at the grocery, there's somebody who's rubbing their nose and scratching it and putting and it on holding a, the, the shopping trolley, you know. Um, and, 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 and again, there are people who feel that you need to go to work regardless of what. You know, um, and, and then they start to do things like putting on gloves or putting on masks. And l let's chat a little bit about that. What about these masks? Are these masks helpful? Is it, it does, will it make any sense for me to put on any particular type of mask, no matter what it was, and to try to go to the mall? or to, w Will that help me at all? It depends on what you mean by help you and help you do what. Right now, there's lots of Sahara dust in the <laughs> atmosphere. Dust masks will help you not to inhale so much of that dust. That's fine. Excellent point, yes. And if that's why people are wearing masks and wearing dust masks, then by all means, kudos to them for trying to protect their lungs from very large dust particles. A dust mask is not going to protect you from the droplets that you may inhale that carry respiratory viruses. So that's not going to be particularly helpful. And when you see the Chinese uh, population wearing masks, walking around, they're not so much protecting themselves from the rest of the population as they are doing their part to protect the population from themselves. Wow. So in reducing the dispersal of respiratory droplets, as we speak, sometimes you see very large droplets, you call them boulders, but then there are also smaller ones that right. float through the air 
as you clock. And they stay suspended they in stay the suspended air. for a little while. They, they travel a little distance. The smaller the droplet, the further it can travel. You speak, you produce large droplets, they travel, they maybe land on the desk. You cough, smaller droplets, more force expelling them, they may travel across the room. Usually droplets may travel one to two meters, that's about three to six feet before they land on something, some surface. So they're not just usually hanging around in the air indefinitely, but they do travel when they're expelled. The hands are more important, actually, than the suspended droplets, because when you take your hands and touch a surface that's been contaminated by droplets, then you pick up whatever is on the surface. The good thing about viruses is different ones have different lifespans in a dry environment. Uh, the novel virus doesn't seem to live particularly long on surfaces in the uh, sort of what they call in vivo, in a live setting. The heat, the humidity, the dryness of the surface, all of those things will kill off the virus in a couple hours. It, it, won't, it won't stay on a surface for several days. Right. But lots of people will touch a surface, especially commonly used surfaces, within a short space of time. An escalator, a subway pool, a doorknob, a bathroom counter, a kitchen counter, all of these things are what you call high touch surfaces. Right. And when we are concerned about not spreading respiratory illness, then we need to look at both keeping our hands clean after we've touched high touch surfaces and doing a little more to keep the high touch surfaces themselves disinfected. Right. And a lot of the routine household disinfectants can do that. So that's where the clean things like the phones, it's not, it's not being scornful, it's just good hygiene. Yes. Right. If there's a, an office phone and you have the, the spray, sometimes people feel, okay, I don't want to, to look like I'm being scornful of the last person. But at, in this sort of setting, you have an excuse. Listen, we're just making sure that after we use the phone, we wipe it off and put it down. So you're not wiping it because somebody else used it. You wipe it because you use it and you put it down. Right. Practices like that help to reduce the spread of droplets on high touch and frequently used and commonly shared objects and surfaces. Right. So, and the, hand, the gloves, people seem to think it's actually very alarming. <laughs> that gloves either make your hands germ-proof or that gloves don't pick up germs. The gloves just pick the germs up and when you have then touched everything with the gloves, and I'm sure you've seen uh, cleaning personnel, etc., do that, they, they have their gloves on and therefore they just touch everything happily. <laughs> and so whatever they've cleaned and touched, then they take, they open the door, they pick up the rag, and the gloves are sometimes more a source of spreading contamination than not, because people then don't change the gloves and wash their hands frequently. They figure this is like a free pass. Right. So they, it encourages less hygienic habits, and it can actually create more of a problem. So we don't really advise gloves and masks outside of the healthcare setting where they're appropriately used and followed by- By trained personnel. By trained personnel and followed by appropriate hygiene practices, hand washing, etc., in putting them on and taking them off. You know, I remember talking to a friend not too long ago. Uh, he was asking me about which mask was the best mask to buy. And I just, I told him, you know, the mask isn't really to be used for that reason under normal circumstances, and it could actually be more harm than good. And for the life of him, he couldn't understand what I was trying to say. But I mean, on a very basic level, if you've ever put on a mask, um, particularly one of the, 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 the masks that are actually designed to keep small particles out of your face, it's very uncomfortable and your face starts to sweat and your lips are sweating and your nose starts to itch on the inside. So one of the things you end up, well, I've been guilty of it myself, is lifting up the mask and reaching inside to scratch, which defeats the purpose the of the mask. Purpose. And people who have on the masks then, because their nose is starting to run, the eye starts to run a bit and then the first thing they do is start to reach into the eye to scratch. And that's defeating the entire purpose of trying to prevent spread because it's now more likely that you're going to acquire the infection. And to be completely honest, even as a doctor, it took me a very long time to realize that the viruses can actually be spread by touching your eyes because I've been guilty of that my entire life. I'm forever rubbing my eyes and scratching them. And I wonder if people who have seasonal allergies might be more likely to get viruses because they're scratching more. I'm often. pretty sure. Something and just because the, the mucous membranes are more inflamed yes. in general. Right, so they'd probably be more likely to pick up to a pick virus. Up things. Now here's the thing, and I saw it in the news and I thought, I'm not sure if they really wrote this correctly. 
it's giving people the wrong impression. Somebody wrote an article, very sensational headline, coronavirus can be spread through the eyes. And <laughs> yes. I'm pretty sure that a significant group of people thought that meant you can, do, if you look at somebody with it, you're going to get it. <laughs> and it's, really, it's not different from anything else. Any of these viruses that latch onto receptors in your mucous membranes will be spread if you take your dirty or your contaminated hands and rub your eyes, rub your nose, etc. If there's a splash, if there's a cough, that somebody coughs directly into your face, holding your breath may not help because the uh, droplets can get into your eyes as well. That's, so that's what they mean by through the eyes. Right. And I think that the way it was written, it didn't quite translate. The other thing that was amusing was that somebody said, well, you know, alcohol at 57% kills the, the <laughs> no, no, sorry, it's 57 degrees Celsius and alcohol at whatever percentage. It didn't right. really give a percentage. Kills the virus and people said, so if I go out in the hot sun and drink, then I'll be good. It's not, no, this is environmental cleaning. Heat kills the virus and the concentrations of alcohol above 70% will kill the virus. It's not things that you ingest. So things to clarify. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for that clarification, Avery. And I think it's time for us to take a break. Uh, so we're going to be back in just a few minutes. Don't go away. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an overpumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screens for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life. Attention all bakers, doubles vendors, and roti makers. Try our high-quality unbleached bromate-free all-purpose and baker's flour. Low price and conveniently packaged in 2 pounds, 2 kg, 10 kg, and 25 kg bags. For wholesale and retail prices, contact Shaklisha Limited, 665-3336, or visit us at Warrenville, Canupia. Shaklisha Limited, quality you can trust. can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app, download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. Welcome back to Doctor in the House, and we're here with our specially invited guest, Dr. Avery Hines. And we're continuing our discussion on the COVID-19, or the 2019 novel coronavirus infection. So Avery, how does this COVID-19 compare to some of its predecessors? Let's see. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that we have three of the quote-unquote famous coronaviruses that we can now compare with one another. The first one was the one that caused the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, in 2003. That's SARS. That's SARS. SARS. And that had a fairly sort of limited spread in terms of the number of uh, persons eventually tailed off. It, it stopped spreading after a, a given point in time. And although it had a fairly high uh, mortality ratio, case fatality ratio, uh, it was, it didn't have a large, uh, as large a number of deaths because it stopped spreading eventually. So there were somewhere around 8,000 cases in total before it burnt itself out. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a 
but just under just under 800 deaths, 756. So when we now speak about this virus and we say it's killed more people than SARS, it doesn't mean this one is worse than SARS because there were fewer people infected with SARS and a bigger proportion of them than had fatalities. Right. So that's that's one important uh, distinction in how we compare numbers. You need to look at not just the number of people who were passed on, but the total number of people who have been infected. Right. All right. Uh, the next uh, famous coronavirus is the one that arose in the Middle East. I'm, not, I'm honestly not sure how it managed to maintain a name that sort of pegs it to a geographic the region. Because right. it's spread all over the world. Yeah, right? yeah, no, well, not so much that, but it's just that the convention is to avoid pegging a geographic region with a, a virus name. Like the Wuhan virus. Like, yeah, that's we, they, they've actively tried to discourage people from calling it the Wuhan virus. It's, not, it's the novel coronavirus 2019 followed by SARS-CoV-2 because it's fairly similar to the severe acute respiratory syndrome in terms of genetics, mm -hmm. but it's not so similar in terms of its behavior. And because it's not the same level of severity, there is a tendency not to want to call it SARS version 2. Right. Uh, so they speak of the disease caused by the virus as coronavirus disease, COVID. And that's the, uh, the WHO sort of endorsed description. COVID-19 is coronavirus disease, 19, caused by a virus that's similar in some respects to SARS, but has not behaved in the same sort of aggressive way. Right. right. Uh, with the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome that arose in Saudi Arabia, uh, in, we in Trinidad in particular, had a lot of preparation and preparatory activity to ensure that our brothers and sisters who had planned to travel to the Middle East for Hajj, et cetera, were aware beforehand yes. that this was a threat and were able to make contact with the healthcare professionals when they came back if they had any respiratory illness. Right. To, you know, we, we spoke about the hygiene in a more and detail. And you actually a part of that process. I was a part. We, we, we sort of designed the process at the Ministry of Health, put that mechanism together that allowed a targeted group of travelers to be as aware of the risk as possible and to be in contact with the health system when they came back. Nobody came back with MERS. Oh. Uh, the, when people came back with respiratory stuff, it was almost invariably flu. Right. Right, because flu is a lot more common. I wonder how many of those people were vaccinated against the flu virus. That's a good question. And we didn't check at that point in time. But MERS... It wasn't that common it, then, it, was it? it, it the, the flu vaccine the in flu Trinidad. Vaccine, the uptake of flu vaccine has seen a, an increase in recent times that we struggled to establish in the early days when the pandemic... 2009 virus emerged. There's a little bit of a rush, and then people just went back to not taking it. I think there's a lot of sustained advocacy at this point in time that's encouraging more people to take the vaccine, and that's good because it's going to reduce the risk of high risk people of becoming seriously ill. But the virus that we were talking about, MERS, in the, in the Middle East was actually very aggressive. As you pointed out, it killed one in three people. And it's still sort of rolling along slowly. It's five years down the road, and it's still, it's still having cases. Wow. But it, this new one seems to be spreading a lot more quickly. It's infected a much, wide, a, a much larger number of people. And the actions that have been taken, are unprecedented the phenomenal public health strategies being employed to reduce the rate of spread. So, so much so that really the only place that there's a lot of ongoing spread is within the Chinese mainland. Anything that has escaped and gotten to another country has been clamped down. And that's a spectacular public health it's, success story, It's a isn't massive it? public health win. The fact that they've managed so far to ensure that chains of transmission did not become established in other countries when you import. Invariably, if you have travel between a place where there's a new virus and anywhere else, cases will show up. What's really important is that the people know if I am ill and I've traveled, I talk to the health system, I get myself tested. If I test positive, then we operate in a particular way to make sure that I can't spread my illness to anyone else. And that's what's been going on. There's been a lot of cooperation internationally that has allowed the public health authorities in different countries to get a handle on chains of transmission that popped up in various places because of international travel. 
So one of the things that I know that the virologists like to look at is sort of the trade-off between how quickly a virus can spread between people's transmissibility and how severely ill it makes you. Because mm. it seems that they sort of, there's, as one goes up, the other goes down to some extent, which is good. Because what you don't want is something that spreads quickly and kills a lot of people. Right. So the things that spread more quickly tend so far to be things that are a little less virulent and that cause less morbidity and mortality. Thank goodness. And uh, that's, that's, that's a plus from, from nature's side of things. We, we, we're happy that nature decided to, to establish that trade-off. Right. Uh, but the main thing that we're looking at with this new virus is the fact that it does, it has uh, shown the ability to spread from person to person originally it was thought to have come from an animal source, and sometimes when things come from an animal source, like bird flu, H5N1, you really have to get it directly from the animal source in order to become infected. It doesn't spread as easily from one human being to another. This one spreads with reasonable ease between human beings. The animal source has become less of a, a key factor. Right. Whereas the initial conversations were about this, uh, this uh, wet market, uh, they, they speak about it. That's become less of the issue because the majority of people now have never been to that market. They closed that market on January 1st. Right. So whatever source there was there is now not the issue, but person to person spread is what is propagating the illness. Is this virus, I mean, it, it, the evidence now, does it suggest that this virus definitely came from animals? Or is this a zoonotic uh, virus that then became transmitted and went on. Are we, are we certain about that? It seems so. So a lot of the uh, virology, the studies of the virus itself, mm. have shown that there's a lot of similarity between the coronaviruses in bats and this, this current coronavirus that's in circulation. There's similarity between the SARS coronavirus and the one that's currently in circulation. But there is also the indication that there may have been another host in there somewhere. I've heard, although I don't know how uh, accurate the the assertion is, that there's an animal called a pangolin that may or may not be one of the intermediate hosts. And uh, it would be interesting if that were the case because the pangolin is used in a lot of uh, folk remedies. It's, it's mm -hmm. actually being hunted sort of to the brink of extinction. Right. So if this is something that has come out of that hunting activity, that use in all these uh, remedies, then that would be another uh, interesting play by nature <laughs> in terms of uh, reestablishing a balance. But I don't know that they've actually conclusively proven that yet. But there's, um, we see more and more conversation about this particular animal, the pangolin. So we know that these events, that what they call spillover events, where a virus circulates within the animal kingdom and then mutates in such a way that it can more easily spread to human beings, those are usually the starting points for epidemics. Because when something newly enters the human population that wasn't there before, Nobody's immune, and therefore everybody is susceptible. Nobody's had it before, so their body can fight it off. So anybody who's exposed has a, a significant risk of getting ill. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get many people getting ill in rapid succession. That's what epidemics are. And if they spread globally, then at some point they reach the threshold that we call it a pandemic. Right. So that's, that's quite clear that there was a spillover event. The genetics suggest that there's a similarity between the animal viruses and the one that we now see, and that the transmission between human beings has become fairly well established. And once you have one of those, then it's usually a little more serious than the viruses that have been in the human population for decades or centuries. The other coronaviruses, the other four that we get as common colds, they, they're so non-famous that they don't actually have names, they just have numbers, they have serial numbers, because mm. they don't really make you very ill. Those right. have been in the human population for a long time. The new ones, when they just pop out of the woodwork, so to speak, they create some havoc, and then eventually it settles. Okay, all right, so let's chat a little bit about the vaccination. And again, probably just trying to use the opportunity to get people uh, thinking about vaccines and thinking about uh, this moving forward. Uh, of course, how, how far are we away from having a COVID vaccine? I can't say exactly how far we are. I know that there's a lot of work being done uh, around the clock 
by the vaccine manufacturers to generate a new vaccine for this virus. Usually vaccine generation used to take somewhere around six months. I think they've found ways to get that, that to cycle down a bit in terms of the time frame, but it's not something you can do immediately. It does take some trial and error and, and it's an iterative process. They try it, see what works, concentrate that. So it's not something that you can say, okay, by tomorrow we'll have it. They're gonna, they're gonna keep working and they're working quite hard at it. There's a lot of funding going to that, uh, that activity so that it, the optimizing the potential for getting a vaccine as quickly as possible. But until such time as we have a vaccine, the hygiene precautions are really our mainstay in terms of prevention. And in terms of prevention of population-wide illness, the other vaccines that we do have are also going to be important for us to keep the population well. So the influenza vaccine that we do have that will protect us against the influenza viruses that we know will be in circulation. The coronavirus might week, be right. in circulation at some point in the distant future. The influenza virus will be in circulation post next week. It's already in circulation and circulation is going to spike post carnival as it does every year. Every year after carnival, everybody comes down with some bad bug and they, they give call it, it the road march. They, right? well, they call it whatever it <laughs> whatever. is, whatever the most sort of uh, high activity road march is. I remember 97 and this is how old we are. It was a big truck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, but, but that's usually a flu. And right. if we can reduce the number of people getting severely ill with that, then we're also freeing up the health system to deal with any new thing that may pop up. So protecting our population against known threats is as important as protecting the population against potential threats. So we need to look at both sides of things. So stepping back to this coronavirus issue, uh, actually, I remember a show, uh, a movie back in the 1990s, uh, starring Dustin Hoffman called Outbreak. Right. Uh, I remember that as a as a young man, it was one of the shows that really terrified me, looking at this, uh, this it was a, a movie about, uh, it centered around, an, I think Dustin Hoffman was an epidemiologist in mm -hmm. the show, and uh, there was this uh, virus that was spread from monkeys to mankind, and it was airborne. That's the first time I'd ever heard the word airborne, and suddenly after that movie, everybody was using it. And um, it really told a tale of what I considered to be a worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, whenever they hear about any sort of new virus, I mean, SARS, I mean, I'll be honest, when I heard about SARS back in 2002, the first thing that came to mind was outbreak. And I thought that that was it, we were done for. Um, but luckily, you know, uh, outbreak after outbreak, no pun intended, uh, we haven't quite gotten there. Uh, what would you what would you say uh, uh, separates the reality from uh, a worst case scenario movie like that? Well, the worst case scenario movies tend to find ways of bringing things together for the purpose of film and cinema that don't usually occur in nature. So the worst case scenario movies like Outbreak give you a, an airborne version of what looked for all intents and purposes, like Ebola, right? right. <laughs> right? Uh, another very good movie that wasn't, it wasn't so much worst case scenario, it was sort of, this could happen, was the movie Contagion with Lawrence Fishburne, and it was a, a, it was a well researched movie actually. And to be perfectly honest, the most important thing that that movie showed was how panic and misinformation can cause more of a problem than the actual, the actual disease itself. Because there was a lot of that being propagated by people, social media influencers, people who just took pleasure in sharing the wrong information and creating distrust of systems. And looking at how systems can get very severely disrupted, no garbage collection, things like that, that if we don't plan for those things, then we uh, we run the risk of having system-wide disruption. That was what I thought was the, the big lesson from the movie Contagion. We don't want to go down that road. We need to make sure we take early preventive steps. We need to make sure we follow the instructions. We need to make sure that we plan to reduce the risk of spread so that you don't have that kind of disruption. That was the main thing with Contagion. Contagion is actually better researched, I think, <laughs> than Outbreak. Outbreak. And I think it was intentional. They liaised with CDC and other professionals in the field to make it as realistic as possible. 
and that, that was one of the things I appreciated about it. And in fact, I almost think it should be like compulsory watching for public health professionals. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't we come into the university about that? We should. We'll so right. how do patients die from the coronavirus? Like what of the people who died? And I mean, I'm aware that um, the data out of China has been published very quickly. I mean, within within a few weeks, uh, I think we saw a, a, a report of the first 40 or so patients and what their symptoms were like, which is where all the doctors have basically been taking all the all the uh, symptomatology from. But of those patients who get the virus who die, what what causes the death, and uh, what groups of people would be more likely to die? I think it's a question that I'd really intended for, 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 for Dale, uh, oh, yes, but I don't the, think he's going to make it tonight. Yeah. Uh, so in, in his stead, and not claiming in any way to be the, an intensive care specialist or a pulmonologist, what we've seen pattern-wise, and that's what epidemiology is, it's about looking at patterns, what we've seen first in that first 41 patient, that paper, and then there's another one with about 425 patients right. or so. What you've seen is that persons in older age groups were more at risk of having adverse outcomes and death. Now, the virus is one that binds to receptors in your lower respiratory tracts. So it's not just sore throat and sniffles. It is bronchitis, it is deep pneumonia, it is deep lung infection. Now, if you have deep lung infection and your lungs can't function the way that they should because their edematous, they're filled with fluid, they're filled with, with uh, mucus, they're filled with white blood cells and pus, that then you can't get oxygen in. And oxygen is essential to life. You can have respiratory distress, you can have respiratory failure, and it's really because the infection of your lungs then shut your lungs down for want of a uh, less simplistic sounding kind of uh, explanation. The other thing that can happen is that beyond the infection of the lung tissue, the sometimes viruses become more widely disseminated. You get system-wide failures. You get what they call sepsis, where you get a bloodstream spread of infection, and it starts affecting other organs, like your kidneys, you know, quite frequently, and uh, liver, etc. And then your body really can't function when these major important organs are badly affected by your infection. So sepsis is another cause of uh, of death, right? So respiratory distress and respiratory failure, and then more widespread organ failure because of sepsis. Those are two of the main things. But what they find is that these outcomes tend to be a little more common in people with other existing illnesses. And quite frequently with cardiovascular disease, so people with heart disease were showing up as having uh, the worst kinds of outcomes. Also, people with pre-existing lung disease. If you already have uh, lung impairment for one reason or another, that's going to make it more likely that your lungs don't respond well to the infection. And then there are things like diabetes that make your immune system a little more sluggish, a little less capable of giving you a robust response. And those conditions also then put you at higher risk of having a bad outcome. One of the things we noted with Influenza, and I don't see them mentioning it as much with the COVID-19. One of the things you noticed with influenza was that people who were overweight had worse outcomes. It's really because you know you don't uh, expand your chest as much uh, when there's a tummy sort of getting in the way of your full lung expansion, that kind of thing. So, it, and that's a, it's like a very simplistic mechanical explanation. But obesity, being overweight, was one of the risk factors oh. that people were concerned about with flu, and I don't think it's going to be super different with uh, the novel coronavirus, but it may not be on the top of the list of risks because other things have taken precedence. Okay. But once we, in any of those categories, we know we have any of those underlying illnesses, then any severe or serious respiratory symptoms should be taken more seriously. You should seek care earlier rather than later if you have any of those pre-existing conditions. Okay. And this applies to what will more than likely circulate the flu. Same thing, if you have pre-existing conditions and then you start to have respiratory illness and 
shortness of breath, difficulty breathing. You don't wait in for several days with that. You go into the hospital earlier rather than later. Correct. Because you don't want to wait until you are very far down the road of uh, advanced disease. The earlier you present with your serious illness, the better the hospital, the health facility is able to help you. And if it's not crowded with people who are actually quite well and should be at home, then you get care faster. So it's sort of a communal responsibility. Don't rush the hospitals and health facilities when you don't have serious, serious illness. But do go, go early when you do. Especially if you've got an underlying condition. Yes. All right. So the doctor that had brought this to the forefront in China um, unfortunately succumbed to COVID-19 himself. Mm. Um, something that was, to be honest, quite terrifying for me to see. Uh, and when I heard the report on the uh, on the BBC one morning, I was I was speechless and kind of spaced out for a little while because it it it, it became a very real thing then uh, that this person who was uh, uh, really working for the benefit of mankind and looking out for the world and trying to just get this word out himself got infected with it and and, and succumbed to to the illness. What are the implications that this would have for healthcare professionals moving forward in caring for persons with COVID-19? Well, the thing is, caring for any group of persons in an outbreak situation is a high-stress uh, environment for healthcare workers. And the fact that there was sort of a massive surge of persons in the health facilities utilizing all of the bed space, utilizing all of the potential staffing, people not being able to go home, having to work multiple shifts, working to the point of exhaustion, all of those things put the healthcare professionals in a situation where they are at greater risk of becoming ill. The lack of sometimes sufficient equipment to protect yourself, PPE, etc. I think that the the sanctions, the restrictions that the Chinese government put in place to make sure that we didn't have too much movement of either people or things also slowed down their ability to replenish some of the necessary stock as quickly as needed. So that had that had its own effect right. on the health care system, and they weren't in a position where they could do too much about that because they were ground zero. So they had a surge of cases and person-to-person -person spread that will not or hopefully should not be seen elsewhere where we have preparation for any individual cases and have the ability to utilize all the stuff we do already have at our disposal, personal protective equipment, etc., to isolate, to protect, to uh, keep the health of the healthcare professionals uh, intact because your healthcare workforce is what you're depending on to deliver care. And having adequate numbers of staff to change shift, et cetera, that kind of thing, when you have a massive surge in patients, sometimes that falls through and then people make mistakes with the PPE. That happened with Ebola. People who were yeah, either worried or exhausted. Personal protective equipment, the, sorry. Sorry, the personal protective equipment, the stuff that, that the gloves, the masks, the, if you make mistakes in putting it on, taking it off, not washing your hands properly, et cetera, when you're doing that, then again, you're at risk because the health facility is a high risk place. So exhaustion, uh, understaffing, overcrowding, all of those things do play a role, but they're less likely to be uh, events that will happen outside of ground zero because the surge should ground not get- Ground zero in China. Yeah, ground zero Wuhan. being the place Wuhan. where the, the event begins and is usually out of control for a bit, right? right? And once we are vigilant and aware of the possibility of introducing any respiratory illness and we take all the necessary precautions with each respiratory illness that shows up, we shouldn't get to there. And that's, that's sort of the, the message, the communication that's being disseminated throughout the healthcare system. So I have heard a lot of talk uh, on social media uh, about postponing carnival. So, aside from the the, the implications on, on, on the, the carnival economy, uh, from a public health perspective, what do you want to give us a couple of comments on that idea of of postponing carnival? I mean, would that necessarily make any difference to the uh, to the landscape of viruses in Trinidad? Um, or is that something that is just 
I don't know, what are your thoughts? It's, it's a, a very contentious issue. It's, it's an interesting response to a new virus. Because every year, as we just mentioned, we have carnival and we spread the flu, and we haven't considered postponing carnival for the flu that everybody gets every year. Right. Now, that's one perspective that we'll just shelf for a moment and then look at the sort of dynamic in terms of volume of travel from affected areas. The virus is currently in circulation in China, where we don't have a lot of direct and high volume travel between China and Trinidad. I mean, it's not that we don't have Chinese nationals coming to Trinidad, but the volume of travel is is quite low. It's not it's not very large, and there are exit screening protocols in place in China to prevent people who are ill demonstrably ill, obviously, people who we can tell are ill from getting onto planes and traveling. There's also some entry screening taking place in countries and ports around the world, including Trinidad. So anybody who's obviously ill coming off a plane gets flagged, gets some attention, gets their, their virus or their illness characterized so you know what kind of threat they may have been to the other people on their flight. So there are lots of things in place at various points in the global public health system that make the risk of bringing a case to the Caribbean and to Trinidad in particular quite low, low to almost negligible. And therefore, postponing carnival for the coronavirus is not a logical step. If you want to postpone it, then you would have you postponed it for flu. And we don't. <laughs> so uh, the, that's not the response. The response is a higher level of public responsibility both before and after the carnival festivities. So after carnival, when people have their sniffles and they have their, their mild illness, that's the time when you want to tell people not to go to work with their sniffles. And I'll tell you a very interesting story. The worry with new coronavirus was that they thought it could be spread by people who didn't have symptoms. And right. that was a big, uh, a big kerfuffle. There are lots of, of talk about this thing in the, in the public health sphere. And it was because there was a traveler from China that had gone to Germany and apparently was not ill, went to lots of business meetings. And then when she went back home to China, she then reported having symptoms and feeling unwell. But people in Germany that she had interacted with got ill and spread virus. So she interacted with two people. Those two people interacted with two more people, so like four people from this asymptomatic lady. But when they actually interviewed the lady, she was not asymptomatic. She felt a little bit warm the first day, and she thought, OK, well, I have to have moved from where I am to another place. She felt some back pain and some uh, tiredness the next day. She thought, yeah, it's jet lag, took some paracetamol, and she sold it on. She felt a little chilly the third day, threw on a shawl and sold it on because the work needs to get done. But she wasn't well. Right. She wasn't falling down. She wasn't coughing and sneezing all over the place, presumably. But she was ill enough to shed virus because she wasn't feeling well. And she went to work. So to me, that's a very good example of don't go to work when you don't feel well because you're going to put other people at risk. And that's one of the, that's one of the important lessons that I think will help us not to have this sort of widespread uh, workplace-wide illness, everybody's sick at the same time. If the first person that feels ill doesn't bring their germs to work, right. if the first kid that feels ill doesn't carry their germs to school. And that level of responsibility is what I think we need to maybe emphasize a little bit more in our communications with each other and with the public. Excellent. All right, so uh, we've, we're just past 9 o'clock now. We're going to take a final break, and we're going to come back to take about two phone calls, maybe. Uh, don't go away. We're going to be right back. High blood pressure is as dangerous as an over-pumped balloon. Measuring your blood pressure every day can save you from risk of high blood pressure. 
MicroLife Fully Automatic Upper Arm Blood Pressure Monitor with Stroke Risk Detection. MicroLife AFib screens for atrial fibrillation while taking your blood pressure. High blood pressure and atrial fibrillation are both considered controllable risk factors for stroke. If AFib is present during blood pressure measurement, the AFib icon is displayed flashing at the end of the triple measurement. Once three measurements are complete, the measurement data are shown on the display. MicroLife, a partner for people, for life. Attention all bakers, doubles vendors, and roti makers. Try our high-quality unbleached bromate-free all-purpose and baker's flour. Low price and conveniently packaged in 2 pounds, 2 kg, 10 kg, and 25 kg bags. For wholesale and retail prices, contact Shikleisha Limited, 665-3336, or visit us at Warrenville, Canupia. Shikleisha Limited, quality you can trust. can be viewed on the go now with the Airlink TV app for Google devices. Simply go to the Google Play Store, search for the Airlink TV app, download the app, click on the link and fill out the form. The account activation will be emailed or texted to the user. It's safe as no credit card is needed. The first 30 days are free and you can subscribe and receive a box for your TV to stream the same content. And welcome back to Doctor in the House, where we're here discussing the novel 2019 coronavirus with Dr. Avery Hines, a public health consultant and epidemiologist. And now it's that time that uh, many people look forward to in the show, where we open up the phone lines and allow you to call in and ask any questions on what you've seen tonight or on what we've discussed. And hopefully, uh, Dr. Hines and myself can uh, make our way through the answers. Uh, so while we're waiting on the first caller to come in, I saw that the WHO, which has great guidance on his website, by the way, uh, for physicians and uh, patients alike, there are a lot of nice infographics there. Uh, one of them spoke about uh, cooking meat thoroughly. And I think in my introduction, I actually uh, spoke a little bit about thoroughly cooking meats. But if, if there were any keen-eared viewers at home, you'd realize that I skipped over that very quickly because I wasn't actually sure why they were saying that. Any ideas about it? No, again, because the live animal markets and the interactions with live animals are sort of a little less regulated in the Asian markets than they are here. And there seems to be a, a, a culture of delicacies that are partially cooked. If you don't cook whatever you're eating sufficiently, then you don't kill all the pathogens. So where they have the tendency to eat things that we may not eat, the importance of cooking their meat thoroughly so they don't pick up pathogens from their food is very important, especially where the transmission of what they thought was an animal born a zoonotic virus uh, was concerned. But across the board, it's important that we always cook meat properly because just the same way you can pick up viruses, you can pick up tapeworms, you can pick up whatever. We need to make sure that we kill whatever shouldn't be in the meat that we are consuming. Anything that's not the meat itself needs to be burnt to a crisp. <laughs> so. Beautiful. And I think we have our first caller on the line. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Doctor in the House. Hello. Hello. Hi, good evening. Good evening. A person who was tested positive. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I'm hearing you. A person who was tested positive with the tuberculosis virus and taken a course of antibiotics, should that person be uh, take the vaccination? Ah, that's a very good question. I'll take this one if that's okay. Uh, so tuberculosis is a disease caused by a bacterium. Uh, um, so it's not a virus per se, and it's an infection that is very serious to physicians. Uh, once we find it presence, whether it's active or not, it's something that needs to be eradicated. Um, persons who have tuberculosis, once they're identified, are given between two and four months of antibiotics, depending on what type of infection that they have. And while they have the infection, yes, they're going to be at risk of ongoing other viral illnesses. I'll say if somebody is very ill with active tuberculosis, maybe that's not the appropriate time to receive a flu vaccine. Um, but otherwise, if they're receiving antibiotics, it would be recommended, yes. 
All right, and we've got another caller on the line. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Doctor in the House. Hi, good evening. Calling for Doctor in the House. Ah, yes, you've gotten through. I think we might have lost that caller. Yes. Oh, there we are. Hi. Just to say, you know, ever since I started minding children and then grandchildren and now great grandchildren, well, I always keep soap and water in the car. I teach everybody to sneeze and cough into the neckline of whatever garment they're wearing. And if my hand has to go anywhere near my face, I always use the back of my hand. Always. And as for the shaking hands, especially in church, I think we need to ban that for the time being. That's all for now. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for the comments, Cola. And we have some good comments there. Um, and, you know, and this is the thing. I mean, everybody's, most people's parents when they're growing up really uh, emphasize the soap and water thing. I'm not too sure, and they always said wash your hands properly. Some, some, some things to tighten up, some of the things that I grew up on, for example, is washing your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water, making sure you get rich, thick lather and subs in, uh, suds in there to be able to wash off any uh, bacteria, any grit and grime, and any uh, viral envelopes that might be on the hand as well. Um, so yeah, hand washing is important. I think with regards to the back of the hand and rubbing the eye, in some cases it might be better because if the front of your hand is going to be touching surfaces, this might be so bad. But I would advise still anyway, only touch your face after you've washed your hands or sanitized your hands. I don't like know. immediately after. So sanitize hands, then touch face. Not sanitize hands, go do something and then touch face later. So if you're going to touch your face, make sure your hands have just been cleaned preferably with soap and water. If not, then definitely with hand sanitizer with an alcohol content above 70%. And frequency in doing this is important for the simple reason that you don't know when you've touched something that's contaminated. So having clean hands is, it's not a permanent state. You clean your hands, you pick something up off the ground, your hands are dirty again. So keeping your hands clean and being aware of not touching hands to eyes, mouth, nose when they're not in a clean state. That's an important practice to develop. And the caller actually also mentioned, uh, I think, a social situation that a lot of us can relate to. And that is uh, somebody puts their hand out to shake your hand. And you, you might have just seen the person sneeze into their hand or rub their nose and put their hand out to shake your hand. And you know, you're caught in this awkward situation where the, 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 the health conscious person inside of you says that there's no way you should touch that person's hand. But then the nice guy inside of you says, are you gonna not shake that person's hand? Do you have any advice for the, uh, for the viewers in this situation? My advice is that we have a, a, a wide culture of greetings. A handshake is one thing. What they call a fist bump, what we call a bounce uh, is another. We have lots of non-tactile greetings, clasping the hands and bowing. And I think that's probably the safest one when we are concerned about not transmitting uh, illnesses, droplet borne illness, people will get over the fact that you didn't shake their hand. If you've seen someone cough or sneeze into their hand and then put their hand out to you, you're not obligated to shake the hand. You can bow, you can weave, you can do just about anything that uh, indicates I acknowledge you without having to touch a hand that you know is dirty. It's the hands you don't know that are dirty that you need to be more concerned about, which is why frequent hand hygiene is advocated. You know, I think some of the sisters at home are actually have very good experience with this already. I don't know if you've ever been caught in the very uncomfortable situation of offering a hand to shake, and then uh, somebody tells you, I don't, I, shake don't, I don't shake hands. Yes. And you realize very quickly, and you say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't, I should have known better. And like, just uh, crawl you know under a rock someplace. It's legitimate. Yeah. So that there's nothing wrong with that? With the viruses yeah. and with the hijab, it's legitimate. Yeah. <laughs> and we got another caller on the line. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Doctor in the House. Okay, trying to communicate. The Hi. Hi. Hi, good night. Welcome to Doctor in the House. Hi, uh, yes, good night. Good um, night. What I want to ask is that um, many of our families in our country normally come out with, uh, from the streets and work with our shoes. And we come straight into our homes with it. And we walk through the whole house. When we take off 
our shoes now. We may have children. We may walk bare feet in our own home and then come and lay in our chair or bed. But this virus also be transferred from walking in the streets with people spitting and all this kind of thing. Well, that's, that's a very good question, Cola. And I'm going to defer to Dr. Heinz. Okay, now the thing is, this particular virus is not so much the issue, but the fact that everyone should take their shoes off before they walk around in the house. That's, that's a basic hygiene principle. That's something that some countries are a lot better at. But we do need to ensure that we don't track whatever is on the ground in the street into our household when we've come in. So that the, fa the fact you brought this up has little to do with coronavirus and more to do with basic hygiene practices that we should be enforcing. So to going into your, your bed or your, your, even your couch in what you call your street clothes, there is, uh, there is benefit to changing out of street clothes and into home clothes before putting yourself on your furniture changing out of street shoes and into home shoes if you wear shoes in the house before traipsing around the house. That's just good hygiene. That's good practice. And we would encourage people to improve hygiene practices overall, not just for coronavirus, but for general health. And I think we're going to take our last caller for the evening. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Doctor in the House. Hello, good afternoon. Good evening. Could you tell, how are you all too? Could you tell me? Hello? You yes, hearing you. Hearing Are you, you hearing me? Can you tell me how regular someone could cleanse their system to purify the body? Thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. So, um, when we talk about, I'll, I'll start off on this one. Uh, when we talk about uh, body cleansers, um, there are a lot of uh, different ideas. It isn't something that uh, mainstream medicine usually uh, endorses from the point of view of doing like a colon cleanse or doing a liver cleanse or a detox or something like that. Um, very often there's not a lot of scientific data that backs the practice. Uh, so, and usually that's what we give advice on the basis of. So if you were to say that this should be done this frequently, it would usually mean that there's evidence to suggest that that would be beneficial when done on, on, on those terms and conditions. Uh, with regards to body cleanses, uh, particularly like colon cleanses or detox cleanses, it's not something that we would usually advise in the first place or further to that, advise a specific schedule to have it done. Um, I don't know if you had anything else more you'd like to add to that. I think the most important cleansing we, do need, we need to do is with the outside of our bodies. Again, basic hygiene. Cleansing the outside of your body daily, twice daily. The organs that cleanse your body internally require certain kinds of things that are usually obtained from good nutrition and good hydration. Your kidneys and your liver, once you are treating them well by eating correctly, by having proper levels of hydration, you, those things then cleanse your body themselves. There isn't necessarily any uh, strong evidence to back up any additional concoctions adding to that. So we wouldn't make recommendations that you do that with any level of frequency. There's some that clearly haven't done any harm, and we won't tell you not to do them, but we won't tell you to do them either. Like that tisane. You know, it's yeah, like, a... Nobody seems to have, have had adverse effects from that. So I tell people, I'm not going to tell you how to take that or if to take that. You make that decision. I can't make a recommendation. I don't have the data. Correct. And the absence of data, we tend not to give advice. Yes. That's the principle of evidence-based medicine. All right, so we've come to the end of yet another exciting episode of Doctor in the House. Uh, Dr. Heinz, shall we give some, some takeaway messages? And I think that there are a lot of takeaway messages that we can give. Um, so I'm going to start off, I'm going to start off uh, with, the, with two, with hand washing, uh, of course, and avoiding persons who are close, close contact with persons who have obvious illnesses. Yourself, if you've got a virus, please try to not spread it to other people. Stay home from work if you've got the virus. Employers, please understand that people do get ill. And uh, um, if you have gotten ill, you should probably see a doctor to be able to get a registered sick leave to take it in. And a pet peeve of mine, if your child is ill, keep them at home so that they don't spread it to other children. And, and those are mine. And let me give way to Dr. Heinz to give some takeaway messages here. So takeaway messages from the public health perspective. Uh, number one, 
the new virus that we're speaking about is still not in our part of the world in, to any great extent. We've had importations in the US and Canada, and that's been sort of controlled. The old virus that we need to be much more concerned about is influenza, and we do need to ensure that people are vaccinating themselves or being vaccinated when they're at high risk. We do want to ensure that people who feel unwell, have difficulty breathing, who have serious illness, know that they should go to seek medical care. And those who have mild symptoms, little cough, little runny nose, know that they should keep themselves at home and not spread their, their illness. Those are the main takeaways from, from a public health perspective. And I think if we combine those b bits of behavior, we'll be in a better place with regard to population health. You heard it there, folks, about the coronavirus, the novel coronavirus 2019. Basic measures should help uh, prevent spread and uh, helping to prevent spread hopefully is going to help prevent uh, very many people from getting very ill and to help keep the mortality of this virus uh, low. And we hope that it never reaches our shores, but if it does, basic preventative measures are paramount. So uh, thanks so much for viewing here another episode of Doctor in the House. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And as uh, one of my favorite YouTubers, John Green, would always say, don't forget to be awesome. Take care. Thank mm -hmm. you.